afternoon. Uh, my name is Remark Salamat and I'd like to start by warmly acknowledging that I'm hosting this webinar from the lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I also acknowledge that we have people joining from across Australia and the region and the traditional custodians of the various lands in which you all work here today. Welcome and thank you for joining of the sixth of our Future of Work seminar series, where we're looking at a particular view at strategic workforce planning. We're seeing this more and more in our environment, and it is not just a HR activity, but we're seeing this across the board as a responsibility for businesses to identify the skills that are required to help transformation and growth. This is really quite clearly a very important topic and you all won't be able to see, but we actually had 300 people registered for this event today, which is phenomenal across every industry and across the regions. And of course, we've seen that today with some of our international guests. So thank you so much for joining. We're also so honored to have a wealth of experience in our panelists today that have been so generous with their time. I'm not going to go through all of their bios because it would probably take me the whole 45 minutes that we have here today, but I'm going to give you a quick snapshot as an introduction. And while I do that, I'd love to ask you a very quick polling question where we can gauge a little bit about what you're interested in and what you really want to get out of this session today. So Dave, can you please put up that polling question for me? That would be wonderful. And I'll, I'll jump in and I will introduce you to our panelists. First of all, we have the lovely Susan Beeston. Susan is the Managing Director of Gemini. Sorry, Executive Vice President and Managing Director of Gemini. Susan leads the Gemini team for Australia and New Zealand, which is really the innovation design and transformation powerhouse for Gemini and is a valued partner of Fathom. Uh, Susan's team works with clients to imagine, design, and deliver change to business models that enable better outcomes for customers. Her experience spans across multiple industries, from finance to public sector to consumer and to retail, and really across the world. She has experience in working in the UK, Europe, the US, and now in Australia. So thank you so much for being part of today, Susan. We also have Alan Moore, who's the General Manager for Organizational Effectiveness at Rio Tinto. Al leads the Rio Tinto's Organizational Capability and Effectiveness team that helps to address people and organizational issues that are of high value and that positions the company for the future. His focus areas include organizational design, productivity, critical skills, and talent. It's actually very interesting. Al is actually a, a psychology background and draws upon his experiences in working with industries in both international strategy and, of course, in his background with niche consulting firms. So we're so honored to have you today. Thank you for being part of today, Al. We also have Bartek Liski, who has joined us from Singapore and who heads up the HR reporting and analytics team for JLL. Bartek is a human capital analytics leader and has over 20 years experience in finance, ops, HR in various roles within petrochemical, telecoms, financial and business services sectors. His current role, he partners with HR and business leaders to translate data into really helping make talent decisions and employee experience decisions. So thank you so much for being part of this session today, Bartek. And last but very not least, it's our very own beloved Dave Burrows, who's the Director of Workforce Planning at Fathom. Dave is our workforce, really leads this within our organization and has over 25 years experience, including working at the Department of Transport in New South Wales. He headed up the global head of workforce analytics at QBE. He also was the manager of workforce analytics at Commonwealth Bank, where he won two CEO awards for innovation. So we're so excited to have David part of this session, and he's going to share some of his experience in a moment. Before I do pass it on to Dave, as a reminder, this is a Zoom format. We'd love to ask you to put in your questions. The whole point of this is to have live questions come through. So please feel free to ask questions. We'll try to get through as much as we can. And anything that we don't get through, I promise you, we will definitely email everyone the responses. 
Before I pass on to Dave, I'd love to just very quickly have a look at the results of the polling. That's great. Amazing. Understanding work skills. Yes, that has definitely been the trend um, that we have seen post and pre. So that would be great. We'll definitely address some of these questions or areas of concern. And with that, I'd love to pass it over to Dave. Thanks, Roman. Without wishing to bore anyone with PowerPoint uh, slides, we're just going to go through a, a couple of things just to set the scene for what we mean by workforce planning and, and, and why we do this at Fathom, our passion behind it. I think we all recognise that it's a hot topic at the moment. Everyone looking at the number of people who registered for this, this webinar, we can see that it's a, a, attracting a lot of interest. And I think there's a few things that I wanted to call out right at the start, just to really set some standards that I've observed talking to our clients. Science and, and, and what we've learned over the last few years. I think the thing uh, that is most important for us is Fathom aren't consultants. We're not trying to just go in and prescribe a solution. We are trying to help our clients use our modeling and our ontology to the best effect. But I think the, the key thing here is, is having a sustainable approach. And that is actually learning how to do this work within your organization. It's really important that you can continue this because it isn't just something you do and then leave behind as a project. But the planning in advance is, is really valuable. Uh, when we're looking at workforce planning, I don't think it really matters whether you're looking at three, five, five, 10 years. The fact is you're planning and, and you're looking ahead, which gives you time to think about the challenges that lay out before you. We were looking to build career paths and retain the talent we have. We've all heard about the great resignation and the war on talent and all of these the phrases that are constant on our, our LinkedIn feeds and in our, our media. And I think the best way for us to start to think about those is to look at the talent we have within our workforce and nurture that talent. There also are considerable cost savings to take that approach. We very much advocate a, a redeployment approach because when you're starting to recruit people, obviously that costs a lot of money. And, and particularly if they aren't out there, it's very tricky and a long process. And also redundancy payments come into the equation and are considerable expenses on any business. And one of the, the key phrases we, we like to use in Fathom is to leave no one behind. You talk about the robots coming and the future of work and all of these really quite scary topics. And it is daunting. But I think if we start to look at our existing workforce and say, OK, there should be something for everyone to move into at some point and let's embrace what's coming rather than be scared of it. So those are the sort of key benefits that I think we can acknowledge. And I've just a few practice principles that we advocate really strongly and I think valuing your people as I said we're looking to redefine our, our existing talent people are assets often when we talk about HR and the work that we do in HR we talk about costs but if you actually invest in your assets you get much more from them you don't shirk investing in other assets in your organization acknowledging the risk because in any planning work that you do there's always risks uh, involved and so I think what we need to do is acknowledge what they are and, and look to mitigate where we can Committing to this as a continuous process is really important. It's not a project. It won't be something you can just do for six months and then move on. You must continue to look at what um, decisions you've taken, look at the assumptions you've made and review them and make sure they're still valid, keeping your stakeholders involved all the way through. And, and to that point, consulting and engagement is really important. It's a very highly collaborative process. It isn't just a HR process. It really does involve every area of the business. You really need to understand the business strategy, which means you need to involve the senior business leaders, the AI technology that's going to be looking to be in place in the next few years. Finance, they need to be involved because they'll need to know how much it's all going to cost. So it's a really consultative process. Now, I really do advocate taking time up front to understand the business that you're looking at really closely. A lot of people are really keen to get into supply and demand and start working with the numbers. And that's a natural uh, reaction because most of us are analysts and we like to work with numbers. But taking the time out to understand the business strategy, talking to the business leaders, finding out what the challenges are, look at what kind of growth they think, because it's really important to understand all the sides that, that you've got to take into consideration. And once you understand where the priorities lie, start to share those as soon as you possibly can, so that all of the business knows what you're working on, and they can see how long it's going to take, because this sort of thing doesn't happen overnight. So that led us to Talking to a lot of our clients, we were working with customers and, and obviously at Fathom, we have a lot of really good, rich data, rich modeling, very strong ontology. We took the 
um, opportunity to start to build out an approach to workforce planning. I'm not going to go through this step by step, but I'll just very quickly uh, talk you through just how we see workforce planning, and then we're going to get into a, a good conversation. So we're looking at, first of all, mobilising, which it, from our perspective is actually bringing the, uh, a client's information into our Fathom ecosystem, aligning it to our ontology. That also helps our clients get their data into a shape that they can use. Step two, I think, is the most important, which is the environmental scan. I mentioned understanding your business strategy, understanding what are the priorities for your business, and start thinking about which are your critical roles that you're going to need in the next few years, whatever that period might be. Then we get into the, the analysis side of supply and demand. Uh, and the gap analysis that results from that supply and demand. And I think the key thing to think about here is when we think about technology, um, we always look at it taking out roles and removing roles. And if you only look at that's a, quite a dangerous position to be in because a lot of businesses are looking to grow. And so you need to consider which areas of the business you're going to grow and the people that you're going to need. And so once you start considering those aspects, it, it starts to have a slightly different picture. Moving on, we then get into strategic development. Everybody's heard of the six Bs. It's becoming a little bit of a legend out there now. And there are actually, I think I've counted at last count was about 11 different Bs. So there aren't any set rules, but we've formulated six that we align to with build being the most important, which is de learning, development, redeploying our people. And then finally, where the rubber hits the road is the implementation stage, which is where you implement whatever you've decided to do strategically. And then obviously that comes with the measures and the effectiveness that you can see from your project so that you're measuring all the way through. So that's really what we're doing at Fathom. I'm not going to talk anymore. No more slides. We're just going to get into a really good conversation. So thanks. From back to you. Amazing. Thanks, Dave. We love our bees, don't we? Six, oh, yeah. nine, eleven. <laughs> I'll take burrows. We're all there. <laughs> so, so thank you. Keep the questions coming. We'll go through the questions um, as they come through. Susan, I'd love to throw the first question at you. In the polling question that we had, the second, I guess, challenge that comes up is really about upskilling, reskilling workforce. How do we do that? In the forefront of leaders that we speak to, they want to grow their business, but they want learning, upskilling, reskilling to be at the heart and to be a way of life for their employees. How do you encourage that within your customers that you work with or where have you seen that work? Yeah, well, I guess, first of all, Gemini is ultimately a big tech company. We're helping our clients to apply technology for different futures. Mm. Absolutely implicit in that is a need for a big skill shift. That's why we're all here today. Kevin does a lot of research and support for our clients around this. And we found recently that in the next few years, 40% of workers will require some reskilling, but 94% of business leaders expect employees to pick up new skills on the job. Mm. So there's a big gap between the need and the intent. And yeah. what we focus with our clients on, of course, is the strategic workforce plan, but other conditions that need to be in place to really enable that to be effective. So it comes down to the steps that organisations need to take to really take their employees on the job discovery of new skills. There are a few things that we work with our clients on. Mm. Number one, absolutely most critical, we think is leading from the top. What we find works best is that this is a board and CEO agenda. So when the skills of an organisation's most important asset are intrinsically tied to its future strategy and ambition, the need for movement is clear, um, but it can't be limited only to the workforce. It's got to apply to leaders too. Mm. So one of the best places to start is what are the new skills for leadership? Leading from the top includes adapting our own skills. The second thing that we see is around mainstreaming learning. So we often see it as a side activity. So it's something over there. We don't make time for it. Don't put a value on it. What we need to do is integrate it into the core of what we do. And that is through you know, providing support and encouragement to build skills, incentivizing, rewarding when they're built, giving employees a chance to actually apply them. So giving them a reason to learn, but also not forgetting that I think all of us need to understand why we need to be lifelong learners and helping people to understand what it takes to be that. So even when hiring or building within an organization, encouraging people to adopt a growth mindset and an understanding of what lifelong learning really means. Yeah. And so the question we ask our clients and I'd ask everyone here today is, are you leading by doing? How are you applying the concept of lifelong learning and, and building learning into what you do, not as a sideline? I think that's really key for helping employees to make the shift and want to be part of the transition. 
Yeah, that's really, I, I think you're spot on, right? Anything leading from top down becomes a philosophy and a way of life, which becomes the beating heart of any organization. It's actually links to my next question to Alan. Al, Rio has done some phenomenal work in working with government and vocational education, particularly, I think there's some really great examples from your previous reports, working in WA with vocational tapes, education universities to help build some of that curriculum and, and education. How important do you see enterprise working with government in supporting that skills uplift? And where do you see the opportunities for other leaders to do the same? So I think just to provide some background on yeah. some of the work you're, you're referring to, we, we partnered in 2019 with the, the WA government and uh, the South Metropolitan TAFE, and we, we developed together the first nationally recognised automation qualifications in Australia. And this is one example of, uh, of the sort of partnerships we... The uh, curriculum is not only available to Rio Tinto's people, but to those with an interest in science, technology, engineering, maths, and that includes year 11 and 12 students. So I think to your broader question about partnership, I think there is a shared agenda among all of the parties that, that you mentioned. Everyone wants a situation where there's a supply of well-skilled people coming into roles that will be increasingly significant. And that's going to contribute to the competitiveness of employers as well as the country. But it's through working together, I think, where we really get to realise that agenda. Mm-hmm. So if we unpack a little bit of the, the, the roles that the parties can play, I think employers understand very well their current and future workforce needs, but they need to communicate what those needs are and with industry partners roll up the sleeves to help education providers respond to them. Education providers, I think, are really well placed to aggregate these needs and provided that they're getting various inputs from industry, they can uh, look at what the aggregate requirement is, if you will, and then use that to create learning that can be deployed at scale and importantly to capture that with just in terms of a formal qualification. Government plays a role, of course, in ensuring that the policy and budgetary settings are there to support this work. Mm. So some of the outcomes just to mention from that part, we're actually really pleased with how that program progressed. What we were able to see is is a really fast timeline from design, build, accreditation through to deployment. And we know that the South Metropolitan TAFE went on to receive a gold award at the World Federation of Colleges Mm -hmm. and, and Polytechnics. And we've had hundreds of our own people now participate to acquire new skills and confidence to work alongside technology. And this complements other learning experiences that our people are having. Yeah, that's phenomenal. And it's something that we're starting to see more and more as we need to upskill our workforce, particularly using latest and emerging technologies. And it's so good to see that year 11 and 12 have access to that, because I think that's definitely something that came up in our last webinar as well, in terms of the future of the graduates coming through the programs. Switching gears a little bit, getting down to the operational, I think a lot of the SWB projects that we work with clients, and, and I'm sure that you have internally within JL they start off with being pilot projects or smaller kind of initiatives. Uh, Looking at holistically within an organization, from your experience, how do you scale those smaller SWP projects or planning pilots to a larger scale? So getting a little bit more tactical or, and is that even the right thing to do to get larger in scale? So maybe first I'll share my failed experience and uh, attempt to <laughs> implement strategic workforce planning years ago, yeah. where we had technology, we had business engagement. Our sin was, I think, not to really see the broader um, scope of what the business wanted to do and get the right people to be engaged. And I think our faith was to really recognize and, and focus, recognize the importance of finance and how, where finance plays the role and we were too focused just on the process in you know, getting using the technology and just uh, running with it and, and implementing a pilot the pilot worked okay but didn't uh, take off everyone else was saying oh, that's another hr project adding to my list of work we are okay without it and so that was one of the, the failures despite of having a decent pilot we didn't have the right engagement what we are trying to do now is something completely different. And we are 
currently dedicating 80% of our effort to get closer to uh, business leaders and finance leaders. But there is a caveat around it. We're really looking for those engaged ones who understand the problem, they open and sharing with us their challenges. And when they look at the strategy, they think years ahead, uh, they sharing with us the, the problems. And that's what we want to really um, focus on and, and get that common understanding from our leaders and stakeholders and work with those who are willing to tackle this problem and willing to share their resources and their inputs into this. And we actually partnered with our Future of Work business consulting team to get all those leaders together. So maybe there will be another occasion to, to expand a little bit more, more on that. Yeah, but I, that. I would say really engage your stakeholders. Make sure you're willing with the right stakeholders. And even if you have a pilot, one pilot, it's not enough. Scale up your pilot. Mm -hmm. Find another engaged leader, maybe with a more difficult area, and work with them. Do another pilot and maybe a third pilot. No, don't think of the whole organization. Find those willing leaders and work with them. Yeah, no, that's really great advice. We've got a lot of questions coming through. So I'm going to start maybe going through to some of these questions. And Dave, I know I might leave it until whenever, whoever wants to answer this one, I'm going to throw, I think this is an interesting one. What would the difference be between strategic workforce planning and the traditional training needs analysis? Because there is a little bit of a difference, I think. Does anyone want to take that question? I, I can take that for a start. Uh, I think strategic means different things to different people. And I think that uh, I don't think it really matters what the length of time is. For me, it's all about the planning. So what you're saying is if you're looking at training needs analysis or you're actually acting when the need arises. And what we're trying to do here is get on the front foot to say, we know we're going to implement this technology. We know we want to grow our business in this area or shrink it in another area. We know that these are our plans. What does that mean for the workforce? And I think this is the critical part because what we're, we're trying to say as HR leaders now is to say, look, actually the business, we can help you with this, but please tell us and please tell us what we need to know about the impact on the workforce from your business. And you may not, they might not know what that is, but they'll certainly know what their strategies are and they'll certainly know what their plans are. Uh, and particularly around technology, if you're including your head of IT, They'll have a, a plan to implement various technologies across the, the, the next few years. And you can start to look at those in much more granular level. Like we do at Father, we actually break the roles down into the component parts and see which tasks will be removed by the implementation of technology. And that enables you then to plan. And that enables you to start thinking, OK, if we know this is going to happen in two or three or five years time, we can think about that now. and We can start building those skills now with on the job training, with new innovative ways, such as the ones that Al mentioned. I think that's the key difference is the planning part. Yeah. Susan, you had your hand up for that as well. Did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, look, uh, great observations from Dave. I think one thing I thought around that is the training needs analysis, absolutely critical component of the approach for mm -hmm. responding to the strategic workforce plan, but also uh, it's a much more broader holistic approach to really apply the plan, which is around creating a learning culture, having a look at how you build the skills internally or buy them from the market or hire them. It's 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 broader still than the training needs analysis as critical component and learning culture is more than training as well. It's about a mindset and a way of working that we need to encourage around our strategic workforce plan. But really interesting um, question. Thank you. Yeah, really great question. We've got a couple of questions that are coming up here around underemployment. And uh, Ingrid's asked, how do we better tap in into underemployed people who may not quite have the skills we need initially, but could learn? Do they need to learn first on the job? How can employers help? Al, do you, do you have a take on that one? Yeah. Look, I, Early, I, anyone I, can answer? <laughs> if anyone wants to, go ahead. I, I think certainly organisations are, are constantly wanting to solve the problem about but where are the pools of talent that, that we can actually access? Yeah. And, I think the question speaks to perhaps seeing a segment of society as perhaps a really viable pool for us. If there's a commitment to put in the effort to actually invest and further develop skills. So I think it's a very good question. I think 
the relevance of strategic workforce planning comes into this because if you can see that there's going to be an increased need for a certain type of skill in a certain geography at a certain point in time and you view that there is a development pathway that's going to take x years to get to exercises the task if you will of saying yes let's reach into this particular segment of our society and let's do the work with them in order to match them to the requirements that we have at a point in time. Yeah. Just yeah. to add to that, Al, we're also seeing a lot of our client organisations doing really great work at tapping into under-leveraged parts of the workforce, creating return to work programs and actively skilling people, adding to their skills, which may have lapsed in the few years they've taken out of the workforce, looking at reskilling, for example, like retired veterans into new careers. There's a lot of implicit skill in underutilised areas of potential workforce that can quickly be tapped into. It's also a really good lens to look at from a diversity and inclusion perspective as to how an organisation can build a workforce that's not classically trained or experienced but is fully diverse and brings many different talents to bear. I think that's the way we need to look at our workforce for the future is fully diverse and very inclusive of the many different talents, capabilities, backgrounds skills building can then address the remainder of the gap. Yeah. I also think that there's that if we've learned nothing from COVID, we've all learned how to work a lot more flexibly and in different ways. And so where possibly before where we all had to be in one place to do our work, that opened opportunities for a whole broad range of people who would have otherwise been excluded. So I think it's another thing that we can consider. Yeah. Also, to add to this, I'm seeing a shift in the views from the, I think maybe given the, the shortage of talent in, in the market, they are much more open to try something new, to mm-hmm. look into the areas, and they much more flexible and more vocal say, I need a mindset. I need the right mindset from the people, and then I don't care if they come from a different industry, because if you have the right mindset, show you on the job how to get up to speed and we can be a little bit more patient but investment in that person with the right mindset is going to pay off um, in the future so yeah. i think I, I see that openness happening whereas years ago a few years ago even before covid many people uh, were just saying yeah that person left i need the replacement 80 percent match and only then are we, we're going ahead now the mindset of the leaders is changing uh, I think for the better and, and that will open up opportunities for workforce who, who wants to switch the career, but also who, those who are struggling to get into their first career. Yeah, and I actually have a following question to that thought for you and you know, being your, the, the data lead here amongst our panel, what kind of data do you need to drive that? Because I think at a high level, all of the leaders that we speak to know that we definitely want to upskill internally for those roles and we want to fulfill those roles internally. What kind of data do you or have you seen being used that can support those business decisions? to find those people. <laughs> yes, I see it's not so easy to scale it at the global organization immediately because there are so many different needs. It's a little bit easier to work with a leader who have a specific need and they identify quite specific talent challenge and they zoom in on that. The data will help, but it starts with that conversation and engagement with mm-hmm. the leader. What do we have currently organization? Talking to talent acquisition leaders as well. They know the market pretty well and they can tell us and they see and they sometimes come up with brilliant ideas where you can search for talent based on their experience. And then we can look into our systems where yeah. when, if we have companies investing in talent marketplaces into platforms where you can have a work on a gig project and tapping into this data uh, helps. Also your HR systems, I think um, they're developing uh, quite quickly, I think invested in the uh, skills cloud, which scans the system, the CVs, the job applications and starts allocating the skills automatically. So yeah, right. it's still early days, but that data keeps coming in, but yeah. I wouldn't overemphasize just the data. Is that honest conversation with the right people in, and scoping the problem, it, it will give you a, a big... Yeah, no, that's really great. 
And it actually leads to the, the question that's come through from the audience. And this is actually something that, Al, we were speaking about this week around the, uh, the skills taxonomy and the importance to adopt a standard skills taxonomy, as Bart was saying. Workday has one. LinkedIn has one. You know, we all have these disparate skills assessments or ontologies. Fathom has our own skills ontology. And maybe you, yourself and Susan can elaborate, and, and Dave as well from the Fathom side, how important is it to have this? skills entry of creating the skills and how important is it to have this standardized in your perspective? Yeah, I think in an ideal world, there would be almost a, a global standard and you can see all the HR platforms and consulting providers work to that. And we can see a lot of HR processes being nicely joined up, but we aren't in that space right now. So I think it's probably more a case of being able to flexibly pivot from one user's ontology or taxonomy to another and, and to not be too caught up with how quickly you can do that. So not aim for a data perfection, but at least getting the usable connection between different tax, I think is important. I think what's been useful for us is to develop a career architecture, uh, which we call our career framework. So we've at least got a master framework or, or understanding, if you like, which provides an overarching inventory of the sorts of people by composition, geography, et cetera, that we have at any one time in the organisation. Mm. And then I know from the experience of working with Fathom, it was really easy to then connect with the ontology that Fathom uses. So that sort of asset within the organisation, I think it's in, in important to have so that it can speak to or, I guess, reconcile different ontologies that HR platform providers come with. Yeah. And, and Susan, did you want to add anything to that? I think you, did you have your hand up? No, but um, I did have a thought <laughs> to add, Romac. Um, I was thinking when we were talking about this yeah. is having the data and the data quality in the ontology is, is table stakes. It's absolutely essential to mm. know your employee. And that's one of the things that I think is critical in the strategic workforce planning area is really truly understanding the skills capabilities of your employee now and into the future and getting it down to a segment of one. So that's where the data becomes absolutely critical and be able to act even at scale is to be able to personalise down to one. And so mm -hmm. we shouldn't underestimate the importance of data in making that progress. Absolutely, absolutely. It is genuinely the number one topic that when we speak to business leaders is how do we identify those gaps and then how do we bridge those gaps what is the curriculum courses micro credentials what do we then tap into for that individual to upskill we've got a question come through from fiona COVID has raised expectations in employees that they'll be able to continue to work from home at least some of the week we love the hybrid working how do you see this shift in the working practice impacting the future needs within a strategic workforce planning so i guess to summarize how do you see this hybrid work model and how are you modeling out your work, Susan, with clients, but Bartek and Al internally? Is that impacting your SWB programs? Are you seeing a shift in how you're looking for skills and people? Does anyone want to take that one first? <laughs> I can take it if you like. Yeah. Um, yeah, I can have a first pass. So cool. I, think, I think one consideration is... When we think about our own supply of skills, I think previously we were perhaps more geographically oriented. So we actually drew a circle around a map to say, this is our supply. I think what COVID and the working from home experience has demonstrated to a lot of organisations is how much we can get remotely. And so the sort of geographic lens on supply has really become less extreme. We can now think about the supply of skills on a regional or, or global basis. So I think that's an assumption that a lot of models have had to revisit is to say, where do we draw the line or do we even have a line in terms of where the supply of skills might come from for particular needs that we have? A second comment I'll make about the COVID experience is it started to flag what skills we all need to work effectively in a different environment. Could mean leading a team that's located remotely, some in a lockdown situation, some in an office environment. What are the extra requirements on leaders? What does that mean for health and well-being? And what are the other skills that our people are asking for in order for them to be effective in a remote environment? 
Yeah. Really interesting observations, Al, and just uh, we see the same in terms of the expansion of our own workforce and being able to bring a fully globally dispersed workforce to our clients. And another thought on strategic workforce planning and how we expect it to continue to shift beyond what we're going through at the moment is there's a rebalance going on between the organisation and its employees. So from a strategic workforce planning perspective, mm. It has to be a balance between demand and supply and really uh, having deeper insight on the supply aspect. What does the team or the employee want in their future? How do they want to gain skills, apply skills? What are the working models for them to work going forward? And part of what Dave mentioned uh, at the beginning was the great resignation, which is upon us. 40% of people thinking about changing jobs, according to Microsoft. I don't know about you, but I'm thinking about what changes I'm going to make going forward out of this, and I'm sure all my team are as well. And so I think for an organisation and its strategic workforce plan, part of it has to be about here's where we think our future lies. Mm -hmm. Employees, how would you like to play a role in the future? Let us help you choose your path or your skills build and we'll make the match as to how it fits into our plan, if that makes sense. So a lot more focused on the employee experience and building their own path and serving them yeah. as opposed to only serving the organisation. I think that'll be critical. I, I agree. I think it's a really important point, engaging the employees, because at the moment we're all referring to the skills in a white collar environment. And once you start looking into industry and some of the blue collar roles, we traditionally call blue collar, but more practical hands on roles. It isn't always possible for them to work from home or work in, in, in flexible locations or even work. For, all right? and, and so I think we need to consider what that means uh, and be more cognizant of the challenges that that those people face and that in, it all, all contributes to towards them having more involvement in not just the role but the purpose for the role as well and I think that's a, a real engagement challenge that we should face. Yeah that's really good points. Oh my goodness I've got so many other questions to ask you guys. <laughs> We've got one minute left to go. Really the last question before we wrap up and this is to every single one of you. What is one advice that you would give people listening today as they get either started or expand their strategic workforce planning programs? What's the one takeaway or maybe one learning that you'd pass on? I'm going to start with Dave because he's usually got a ton of them. <laughs> Um, I would say that there's lots of things that you can say about getting started. You'll never have enough data. There's never already been covered. I would say the biggest thing I would advocate is collaborate, collaborate. Yeah. Uh, I think talk to the business, understand what the business leaders want. I think there was a question earlier around how do you get people who are unwilling to, to advocate or, or embrace workforce planning? Yeah. Uh, once they know what's in it for them, they will uh, embrace it and they will see that you're actually going to help them. And I think once they buy into that and they understand how you can help, they will be a supporter. So the collaboration. Susan? I think for me, it would be strategic workforce planning is as much about the organisation and its future and ambition as it is about the employee and their future and ambition. And making the match is the key to future success. Yeah. Great advice. Uh, Al? I think my advice would be focus on the highest value, highest risk situations rather than to feel you have to develop models and plans for the whole organisation and have them at an equally sophisticated level. So yeah. keeping that really uh, tight focus. That's really good. That's really great advice. Focus, focus. And Bartek. Last but not least. Yes, I think I alluded to that a little bit earlier. Find the right leader, the engaged person who is willing to partner with you, who is open about the challenges and willing to put their own resources into this partnership, then this is a partnership. And however small that is, at least you are on the way and you will solve at least one problem for one part of organization and others will see that and they will engage with you. Uh, the technology will come and, and help, but there is no substitute for finding the right partnership and working on a specific problem, which is painful for one part of the business. That's amazing. That's very good advice. Thank you so much. 
I'm so sorry we're over time. Unfortunately, we, we have to say goodbye. So I wanted to thank each one of our panelists today. Again, thank you so much, Susan, Al, Bartek, and Dave. Thanks for being part of this open dialogue. I know it's just the beginning. We've, we've only touched the surface. There's lots of questions that we need to get back to people on. So we'll make sure we do that. Uh, a big thank you for everyone that's joined today. If you've taken one thing away from this session, then it's been worth all of our time. So thank you. I will definitely be in touch. I will be sending through the SWP, the first of our SWP playbooks to help you start this journey or move along your journey if you're on one. If there's anything that myself or the Fathom team can do to assist you as you're going through this planning stage, please don't hesitate to contact us. We look forward to seeing you soon. And in the meantime, I hope everyone stays healthy and safe. And we look forward to seeing you in our next webinar. Thank you again. Bye. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye.